Dasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakalpa Terubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhaihevacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome all the devotees back to our study of Bhakti Shastri Bhagavad Gita and we're on chapter 9 this is lesson number 6 and the title is Raja Guyam mm. okay so we'll look at the aims what we want to achieve today so there'll be an overview of the ninth chapter with the main sections I want to understand the connections and then we'll look at the different principles of pure devotional service and then we'll have also the essence of Bhagavad Gita based on the final sloka of the ninth chapter verse number 34 so those are the three aims which we have today okay so beginning with the overview here you can see the breakdown of the chapter so the chapter begins with uh, the importance of hearing about Krishna and Srila Vyasadeva in presenting this ninth chapter he describes what are the qualifications and what are the disqualifications right so what was the qualification anybody remember we'll read the first verse Yes. Non-envious non people, they should be non-envious. Yes, right, should be non-envious. That's one qualification, yes. Good. The ninth chapter begins, My dear Arjuna, because you are never envious of me, I shall impart to you this most confidential knowledge and realization, knowing which you shall be relieved of the miseries of material existence so we should be without envy we want to get this knowledge and the disqualification is described it yes they should not be faith they should be faithful they cannot be faithless right described in verse number three yeah. Th those who are not faithful in this devotional service cannot attain me therefore they return to the path of birth and death in the material world so in this way we're told the qualification and the disqualifications so if somebody has faith that's a qualification if somebody has if they're not envious that's another qualification if they're envious, it's a disqualification. And if they don't have faith, also it's a disqualification. Right? So that's the first three verses. And then Lord Krishna goes on to explain about his achintya shakti, his inconceivable potency. And we have described it here as Krishna's achintya bed abeda relationship with the material world, right? Would someone like to explain this? What do we mean when we say Krishna's achintya bed abeda relationship? 
Can I try, Guru Maharaj? Please, yes. Yeah. Krishna pervades and maintains the entire material world by his energies, yet he is not in everything. Yes, right. He's a loop. He's a Recording loop. in progress. Yes, Krishna is aloof. Krishna is not part of this cosmic manifestation. So it's achintya, it's inconceivable, this relationship with the material world. How he's in everything and pervading everything and supporting everything, but still he's aloof from it. All right, so that's that important section up to text number 10. And then the next section, we describe uh, verses 11 to 19, the non-worshippers and the worshippers. So, text number 11 describes who? What kind of people? The impersonalist. Impersonalist. Right, the impersonalist. We hear, so are they worshippers? Are they impersonalists? Are they worshippers? No, 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 they're not worshippers, right. And then text number 12 describes the result of that impersonalist uh, philosophy. Whatever they try to do, mogasya moga karmano moga jnana vicheta, whatever they try to do, their attempts for cultivating knowledge or fruit of activities, will all be a failure and ultimately they'll attain the nature of rakshasas, they'll become demoniac. So that was described 11 and 12 and then 13 and 14 describes the Mahatmas, all right? And what's the nature of the Mahatmas? What are they doing? What are their activities? They are always Always engaged. Always engaged in devotional service. Devotional service. Yes, what particularly are they doing? They're chanting the glories. Yes, chanting, chanting the glories of the Lord. Satatam kirtayantumam, right? They're always chanting the glories of the Lord. The holy name is always on their lips. They're always speaking the glories of the Lord. So, of course, that these Mahatmas, they are worshippers of the Lord. So, 14, and then text 15 was the Anya, Ananya, or Anye, right? That's not wrong. Now, how did it go? Text 15 it describes about the others, right? Hmm. Yes. Jnana Vigyana Chapi Anye. So, so the verse number 15 is like the summary and it's going to de it's describing about the others. There are others. Who are these others? The worshippers of yeah, demigods, worshippers. and the impersonalist. The impersonalist, right. Which one is the most common? Which one? Oh, the impersonalist. The, the impersonalist is the most common. Yes. Mayavadi. A lot of Mayavadis, many people, they're influenced by the Mayavadi philosophy. The most common. And they're the third class. Yes. They're the third class people. And then the demigod worshippers, they're like second class. Second. Vishwarupa. And the Vishwarupa, they're like first class. Because yes. they're contemplating the Lord through the material nature. They're not devotees yet, not proper devotees, but they can become with good association and with good guidance. All right, so that was text 15, and then 16, 17, 18, 19, there were four verses which describe the worship of the impersonal Brahman, the Vishwarup. The vish worship of the Vishwarup, right. And how we're told how we can see the Lord in so many different things, right? Yes. Krishna says, he's, uh, I am the goal, the sustainer, the master, 
the witness, the abode, the refuge, the most dear friend. I am the creation and the annihilation, the basis of everything, the resting place of the eternal seed. All like this is relating to the impersonal aspect of the Supreme. So, I, I, so contemplating the Lord through these different things within the material world. It's not actually impersonalism, but they're contemplating the Lord through the objects of the material world. So that was the impersonalist. And text 20 gets into the demigods, describing the worship of the different demigods. And we hear how the worshippers of the demigods, they'll follow the Vedas, they'll follow the Vedas, and they'll, uh, th this way they're able to satisfy their material desires. The Vedas describe a lot of karmakandi activities. And so people have material desires, they worship the demigods, and they get results. And they enjoy it, and ultimately even they can go to heaven. And they'll go to heaven and stay there for some time, and then they come back. And so that's the worshippers of the demigods, 20, 21, and then 22, Lord Krishna describes what happens if we worship him, right? And what does Lord Krishna say when we worship him? What will happen? May I try something? I get... I Right, right. But the Lord says, for those who always worship me with ex exclusive devotion, so those requirements are there. Ananyas, chintayantum mam, te gyan paryupasate, paryupasate. Tesham nitya bhyuktanam, nitya bhyuktanam. They're always constantly worshipping the Lord. And paryupasate, they worship the Lord very correctly, very properly. So he's very pleased with their worship. And the result is yoga kshema vahamyaham. I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. And then uh, that's 22. And then 23 describes about devotees who worship other gods, they do so in the wrong way. So it was mentioned, the avidi purvakam. They're, they're worshipping other gods. It's actually meant to be worshipping, they're meant to be worshipping Krishna. But they do so in a wrong way. And what happens to them? They fall down. Yeah, they fall down. That's right. They fall down. They come back in the material world. And then Lord Krishna also describes, text 25, that you get the results. You worship the dev devas, you'll go to the planets of the devas. And you worship the ghosts, you'll go to the planets of the ghosts. You worship the pitris, you'll go to pitri loka. And you worship Krishna, you'll go to be with Krishna. And so that brings us to the last section, which we're going to be looking at today. Text 26 up to the end of the chapter, and we're going to hear about the glories of directly worshipping Krishna. Hmm? Okay, so we're going to hear about worshipping Krishna. Of course, we did speak something about text 26. Remember text 26? Who remembers? Yes, yes? what's the verse? Patram Pushpam Falam Translation. If, if one offers me with love and devotion a leaf, a flower, a fruit or water, I will accept it. Die. Very good. Yes. So this, this verse 26 along with 22, verse number 22, Yoga Kshema Bahamiyam, very important verses, right? And text fourteen is also text fourteen is also a good verse. Satatam kirtayantumam. 
describing the activities of the devotees. All right, so here's text 27. Who would like to read the verse for us and chant the Sanskrit? And... Yes? May, may I? Yes, go ahead. Yat karusi yat nasi yat juhusi dadasi yat yat tapasya si konteya tat puruswa mat ap arpanam. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away, and whatever austerities you perform, do that, O son of Kunti, as an offering to me. Hare Krishna. Okay. So, mad arpanam, an offering. You want to offer something to Krishna. So, this is a thing. <laughs> it's described that... It's described. What's happening? I just muted the rest of them. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's described that uh, w when Krishna speaks this verse, he's coming down a little bit from text number 26. Text 26 was actually emphasizing the importance of pure devotion, bhakti that is devotion which is so important. Krishna wants devotion. Krishna didn't just, he didn't want our offerings as much, what, he didn't care so much about the offerings because Krishna has so many goddesses of fortune all serving him. So he doesn't need our fruits and our offering, but what he really wants is our devotion. Of course, we shouldn't think Krishna just wants us to give leaves and fruits. We should actually want to give everything to Krishna. But of course, not everyone's ready to do that, but not, not, not everyone has devotion. Therefore, Krishna speaks text number 27 and he says, well, whatever you do, whatever you eat, you can, get, you can offer it to me. So this is not actually bhakti yoga, but this is karma yoga, arpanam, mad arpanam, offering something to Krishna. There's a difference, you see, between bhakti yoga and karma yoga. In bhakti yoga, we understand everything is Krishna's. So we're giving what is Krishna's, it's all his. But the karma yogi, his thinking is, I'm giving this, I'm giving this to Krishna, mad arpanam, an offering to Krishna. So that's not on this, it's not on the same level as devotion. It's a little down from the path of devotion. Of course, if one gives regularly to Krishna, by doing karma yoga, gradually we'll become purified. Of course, you studied the, the yoga ladder and you know that karma yoga is be below bhakti yoga. So this is uh, the verse here. We want to offer to Krishna, do something for Krishna, do some austerities for Krishna, giving something giving away for Krishna, like that, making offerings to Krishna, developing the, uh, that nature to want to offer to Krishna. And as we go on making more and more offerings, gradually we would come to understand actually everything is Krishna's, nothing is mine. Because we, as we offer to Krishna, we will become purified and Krishna will purify our heart that we can understand actually this is Krishna. So I'm giving back to him what is his. Just like when we, when we take bath in the Ganga, we take the water of the Ganga in our hands and we offer that water of the Ganga back to the Ganga. It's all the Ganga, but we're offering it to the Ganga. And so the same way the devotee is offering to Krishna. All right, we have some comments on this. This is Prabhupada lecturing on it. 
In Mayapur, on the Srimad Bhagavatam class, can someone read? Yeshara Mataji? In the beginning, one cannot take to prove Bhakti Yoga. Karma Yoga means Yad Karoshi, Yad Asnasi, Yad Juhoshi, Dadasi Yad. That is Karma Yoga. Whatever you're doing in the beginning, one cannot take to pure Bhakti Yoga. Therefore, Karma Yoga is recommended. Never mind whatever you are doing, in that position you can become a devotee. Karma Yoga, that is, people are interested with different types of work. So therefore, Krishna says, yet Karusi, never mind whatever you are doing. So how it becomes Karma Yoga? Now, Kuruswa Tat Mad Arpanam, you give it to me. Thank you, Madhiji. Yes, uh, you you can see, you can see. Not everyone is able to do bhakti yoga in the beginning. If we give people beads and ask them to sit and chant, or if we ask people to read the books or to come and sit and listen to classes, not everyone can do it. They're not ready to do bhakti yoga so much. But karma yoga is easier for a lot of people, that they can do karma yoga. And we do have, in our, in our Krishna consciousness movement, we do find a lot of uh, opportunity for people to take up karma yoga, working for Krishna, offering things to Krishna, building temples for Krishna, giving donations for Krishna, like that. So that's easier for people than to do bhakti yoga, to do intense bhakti yoga, you know. Sometimes people go on a japa retreat, the japa retreat for two or three days, you know, and after two or three days, wow, <laughs> you know, they're, <laughs> they're glad that's over with. <laughs> they, they, they didn't have much opportunity to associate with the holy name before, and when they go on a japa retreat, it's a big change for them. But that's intense bhakti yoga. Well, not everyone's able to do that all the time. Of course, people have other things to do. They have families, they have jobs. They can't do all the time bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga strictly means hearing, chanting, remembering Krishna. So bhakti yoga is good for purification to help us to become more qualified for bhakti yoga. Okay, Mad, oh, here's some more. We can have someone else read this one. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Karma Arpanam, 28. There's a story that some sannyasi went to a householder because a sannyasi begs from householders. They are not beggars, but they introduce themselves as such so that the householder may receive them and take some advantage of their knowledge. So the sannyasi... Thanks, Khan. Mataji, we, we lost you. Uh, I'll just continue. So the sannyasi, sannyasi went on to Replied, all right, give me some ashes. Just begin your charity. Put a little water. It does not mean that he is begging. He is just inducing you to the practice of offering everything that belongs to him. Like Chashu Bhagavad. Hare Krishna. Yes, Guru Maharaj, I, we, we lost her because there was no audio. Would you like us to read again? Yeah, I think we have to read it from where she stopped, right? Okay, sure. So the sannyasi went on, went to the to a householder and the house and the housewife said, Oh, this beggar is going from door to door. Give him some ashes. So the sannyasi replied, All right, give me some ashes. Just begin your charity. So, similarly, when Krishna asks, give me a little flower, a little fruit, a little water, 
it does not mean that he is begging. He is just inducing you. He is just inducing you to the practice of offering everything that belongs to him. Mm. So, this is a, an, an interesting point here Prabhupada is bringing up. Is that is Prabhupada is explaining to us that when Krishna asks for a leaf, a flower, fruit or water, it doesn't mean that we should be satisfied just to give small things like that. But Krishna is giving us the chance to practice. He's beginning, getting us to begin the offering to him. And of course, we ultimately we want to offer everything to Krishna. As much more is what much more than what we have much more than just giving leaves and flowers that's very easy things to give so don't be satisfied by just giving leaf and flower but that that's the beginning of the offering okay well i'll reach at verse number 28 because we spoke about 27 28 says in this way you will be freed from bondage to work and inauspicious and inauspicious and its auspicious and inauspicious results. With your mind fixed on me in this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated and come to me. So Krishna is describing the results of that kind of karma yoga. You see? That you get will be free from the bondage of work. That is karma yoga, right? Remember in the First section of the Bhagavad Gita we heard Arjuna was worried about reactions, sinful reactions, and Krishna told him you do it as karma yoga and then there's no reaction. So here also text 28 is describing you'll be free from the bondage to work and its auspicious and inauspicious results. So that is the effect of karma yoga. We get free from reactions. All right. A bit more here on karma yoga. Yes, someone can read. So Nishkarma karmis are attached to the specific work they perform. To them, Krishna therefore says that whatever you are already doing, do that as an offering to me. First perform the activity and then surrender its fruit to Krishna. Bhakti is different. In Bhakti, we first surrender to the order of Guru and Krishna and then act. We make no distinction between the activity and its fruit. Everything is offered in surrender to Krishna's lotus feet from surrender onto me. Okay, thank you Prabhu. Yes. <clears throat> So again, another distinction between bhakti yoga and karma yoga. That in karma yoga, we do the work and then we surrender the result. We know there's different kinds of karma yoga. There's sakama karma yoga, where we're attached to the result and we won't surrender so much of the result. We may send, surrender a little bit. And then there's niskam karma yoga where we, we give all the result to Krishna. But in Bhakti Yoga, we surrender first and we'll, we'll do whatever is required for Krishna's service. In the Karma Yoga, we're attached to working in a particular way. We're attached to, you know, doing our duty. We think of our duty Maybe you're a Kshatriya, maybe you're a Grehasta or whatever, Brahmachari. You have duties to perform. But in Bhakti Yoga, we'll do whatever is required for Krishna's pleasure. All right, then that's, so let's take 27 and 28. And then 29 brings us to this verse. Right? Someone like to read for us? The woman, when the sun, in the woodshine, is a friend, 
<laughs> okay, thank you, Prabhu. It seems to everyone's having some difficulty with the Wi-Fi today. I think uh, the telecom is not too good. All right, so this verse is spoken because we see Krishna appears to be partial. We know that Krishna appears to give pleasure to the devotees and kill those demons. And so it appears like Krishna is very partial. He's not very, there's no neutrality in him. So people may think like that about Krishna. And so understanding that, Krishna spoke this verse, saying that, no, I'm not envious of anyone, of course. Krishna has no reason to envy anyone. He has his Bhagavan. He already has everything. So why would he have any envy for anyone? And he said, also, I'm not partial to anyone either. And so, of course, we will say, well, no, you're partial. But Krishna says, no, I'm equal to all. But then he adds, then he qualifies it. But whoever renders service unto me in devotion is a friend, is in me, and I am also a friend to him. So it appears to be contradictory. Well, just a minute, you said you're equal to everyone, and then you say whoever renders service to you, he's a friend to you, and like that. So you, you certainly make distinction. But Srila Prabhupada argues that no, it, it's natural. It is natural that somebody is rendering service to you and, and somebody has devotion and feelings for you, then certainly you'll have affection for him. You'll appreciate him more. Prabhupada gives the example, he says, just like a woman, a, a mother, she may be a married woman with children, so she will have love for all children, but she'll have a special love for her own children. Her own children, born from her own womb. So naturally she'll have even more affection for her own children than she has for uh, all. She likes all children, but she likes her own children especially. And then the partiality is also argued in the case of a uh, the judge, Prabhupada gives the example that you may go to court and there's a judge and, and somebody comes to the court and he's, uh, he's been injured in a motor car accident and it was the fault of some, some other person. And so the man comes to the court and the judge considers the case and then the judge may award compensation to the man that he was injured due to the fault of another person and he may give a reward and so much money is to be paid to this man, it's compensation. And the person after that, another person comes in the court and this person's guilty of some crimes and the judge sends him to jail. So the, uh, somebody, the onlooker may say, oh, you put one man in jail and you reward the other man? Is that, isn't, is that, that's not fair. You're showing partiality. You give this one man money, a reward, and you put the other man in jail. Shouldn't we be equal to everyone? But the judge is doing his duty. Someone acted in a way that they should be rewarded and someone acted in a way that they should be punished. So it's not partiality, it's just the natural consequences of one's own activities. So in this way we understand the dealing of the Lord. This is from Srila Prabhupada's purport to this verse. Someone please read for me. Who, who can read? Yes? Deepshika Mataji. Okay, now I mean, uh, Guru Smarana Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhu, yeah. Bhagavad Gita 9.29 purpose. 
Yeah. One may question here that if Krishna is equal to everyone and no one is equal to no one is his special friend, then why does he take a special interest in the devotees who are always engaged in his transcendental service? But this is not discrimination. It is natural. Any man in this material world may be very charitably disposed, yet he has a special interest in his own children. The Lord claims that every living entity in whatever form is his son, and so he provides everyone with a generous supply of the necessities of life. He is just like a cloud which pours rain all over regardless of whether it falls on a rock or land or water. But for his devotees, he gives specific attention. Such devotees are mentioned here. They are always in Krishna consciousness. And therefore, they are always transcendentally situated in Krishna. Oh, very good. Thank you very much. All right. So this is nice explanation of this verse. And try to remember these different analogies which Prabhupada gives. Right? And here's another one. Could you keep reading, Maharaji? So this, so this is the reciprocation of devotional service to the Lord. And if there is any devotee who is constantly engaged in such devotional service, God will never forget him. As he is... Sorry. As he is always unto me, similarly I am also unto him. There is no question about disappointment. If you do a little service for the Lord, it is recorded in Krishna's notebook. Don't think that your labor is going on then. Everything, whatever you do sincerely is noted. It is clearly stated that as they are constantly thinking of me, similarly I am also constantly thinking of them. How they have can come make further development, how they can come to me very quickly. How they can be free from contamination? He will give you the intelligence. Lecture on Bhagavad Gita 7 to 9.10, New York, 1966. All right. All right. So you can see Prabhupada quoting parts of different verses from the scriptures. Te shu te mai, right? So, what is the verse? Where is it from? Te shu te mai. Yes? Verse 29. Yes, chant the verse. Sam Samoham Sarva Bhuteshu Name Drishtyo Stita Napriyaha Ye Bhajanti Tumam Bhaktya Maite Teshu Chapyaham Maite Teshu Chapyaham Mai te te shu chapyaham. Prabhupada's te shu te mai. It's like Prabhupada sometimes puts it in a different order when he's speaking. So it's from the verse, but Prabhupada put it in a little different order. But Prabhupada explains the meaning. As he is always unto me, similarly I am also unto him. Right. Whoever renders service to me, he is a friend, he is in me, and I am also in him. And then Prabhupada quotes this verse, Svalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahatobayat. Which verse is that from? Ma chapter 2, Maharaj. Neha vikraman nasusti patravayana vijyate sal apyasya dharmasya trayate mahatobayat. In this endeavor, there is no loss of divination, and a little advancement in this path can save one from the most dangerous type of fear. Yes, very good, Mataji. You've learned the verse very nicely. Well done. Right, it, you can see it helps. This is why we have to learn these verses, because Prabhupada often, when he's giving class, he may quote a little bit from a, a verse, and we have to be able to identify it. We should know what he's talking about, where it's from. All right, we'll go ahead, then text number 30, 
we come to text number 30. The Lord Krishna was describing his equal to everyone. And now he's going to describe here, even if somebody does the most abominable action, but still Krishna is equal to them. Right? Text number 30, who would like to read for us? Yes? Kurusvarna Mataji. Even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. Mm, right. So, there's achar. Achar means the proper behavior, proper action. We, some, we often hear prachar. Prachar is the preaching and achar is the behavior. So, sudur achar, the most abominable action. So, somebody commits the most sinful things. But, bhajate mam ananya ba. If he is engaged in devotional service, then he is sadur eva samant. He is considered sadhu. Oh, so this is this is Krishna's impartiality. That even though somebody is doing the most abominable action, but Krishna see that he is a devotee. Krishna is ready to accept him. So we're going to hear from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur how he comments on this verse. Someone like to read for us? Yes, my attachment to my devotee is my very nature. That attachment does not decrease even if the devotee commits wrong. For I make him come up to the highest standard. If someone with bad conduct, addict to violence, thievery or adultery, so Durachara, worship me and worships no one except me and does not follow any other process like karma or jnana and has no other desire, then my desire, Ananya Bhak, he is my devotee, Sadhu. But considering his bad conduct, how he, is he a devotee? He is to be respected, Mantavya, as a devotee because of his devotee qualities. It is a command. Not doing it so is offense. My order is the authority. Oh. Hare Krishna. <laughs> so Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is speaking on behalf of Lord Krishna here. You see? And Lord Krishna is defending this person. That he said he is to be respected as a devotee because of his devotee qualities. It is a command. Not doing so is offence. Krishna is the authority. We have to accept Lord Krishna's authority. So even though someone has this problem, mentioned here some of the things he may have done, bad habits addicted to violence, thievery or adultery, adultery but he worships Krishna, and he worships no one except Krishna. So this person's a devotee. <laughs> so Lord Krishna uh, describes, and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur anyway is telling us how Lord Krishna considers this person. So it continues, he continues, so, he should be considered a devotee in that portion where he worships you. And as a non-devotee in that portion where he commits adultery. Right? This is not Krishna speaking. This is the, 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 devote, the other devotee speaking. Right? And so he's, he's saying to Krishna, so, he should be considered a devotee when he worships you, when he worships you, Lord Krishna. But he's not a devotee when he commits adultery. 
Now, we would think that would be proper. We would think that's probably right. But Krishna said, no, he should be considered as a devotee in all his parts. You should not see his bad qualities at all. He is completely convinced. Samyag vaya vastitaha. He makes a splendid resolution. I will go to hell for my sinful activities, which are hard to give up. But I will not give up dedicated worship of Krishna. So, in this way, they're describing the, the thinking of the devotee, this person who has a, the very bad habits, who has engaged in sinful activities. So he's thinking, I will go to hell for all my sins, and because it's very hard for me to give them up. Just like adultery, somebody may have a relationship with another uh, man or another woman outside their own marriage. And so they may find it very difficult to give up that illicit connection. Or someone may be addicted to stealing, robbing. They just can't stop themselves somehow. They just do it. But at the same time, they're very attached to worshipping Krishna. And they can't give up their worship of Krishna. So we're told we should not see his bad qualities at all. And then continues, oh, oh, we're going on to Prabhupada's purport. We'll continue, anyway, we'll come back to that. It can, continues later on. This is uh, from Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada's statements. We were hearing from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Now we're going to hear from Srila Prabhupada's purport on this section. Very important section. Right? So, Bhagavad Gita 9.30 purport. On the other hand, one should not misunderstand that a devotee in transcendental devotional service can act in all kinds of abominable ways. This verse only refers to an accident due to the strong power of material connection. So Prabhupada is clarifying this situation for us, how we should understand it. It's not that you can be, a, you think I'm a devotee and you do all kinds of these sinful activities. Then say, no, Krishna says, api chet sudaracha. Krishna says, yeah. <laughs> and we may try to use this to support our activities. But Prabhupada said it only refers to a, when due to an accident, due to the strong power of material connections. It's not, it was, in other words, it wasn't contemplated. It was just an impulsive thing which happened. And then the second point, devotional service is more or less a declaration of war against the illusory energy. As long as one is not strong enough to fight the illusory energy, there may be accidental fall-downs. But when one is strong enough, he is no longer subjected to such fall-downs, as previously explained. So Srila Prabhupada saw the difficulties, you know, he saw many young men come to the Krishna consciousness movement and he saw them take up Krishna consciousness with a lot of enthusiasm and with a lot of dedication and energy. But he also saw that there were fall downs. Some of the devotees who were very close to Srila Prabhupada and who Prabhupada had a high regard for, and they equally loved Prabhupada, but still somehow they, were, they had fall-downs. 
And so Prabhupada talks here about this accidental fall downs because they're not, they were not strong enough to be able to fight against the illusory energy. Not strong enough in the sense that, well, they come out of, you know, come from material world and become a devotee. They were not born in devotee families and they come to Krishna consciousness, maybe they're 18 or maybe 21 or 25, like that. And so they've had a lot of association with the material world. And so they come to Krishna consciousness and they're, they're attracted, they really want to be devotees, but somehow the material energy is very powerful and they have fall down. So, but Prabhupada explains, when one is strong enough, he is no longer subjected to such fall downs. So people have to be, they have to develop their strength. It's not a small thing to get that strength to be able to fight the material energy. And then Prabhupada concludes that this verse, he says, no one should take advantage of this verse and commit nonsense and think that he is still a devotee. If he does not improve in his character by devotional service, then it is to be understood that he is not a high devotee. All right, so Prabhupada is emphasizing the point that the devotee should consider himself to be very fallen in his character. And he should hate himself actually for engaging in these kind of sinful activities. But it's understood that sometimes there will be fall downs. Now Prabhupada even had given people uh, positions and he made them like big managers and sometimes even sannyasis, but he saw that they, sometimes they had fall downs. And sometimes Prabhupada would give them the chance to come back. He would give them the chance to come back and because he understood that their fall down was not intentional, but it was more accidental. But when the fall downs happen again and again, then it's a sign that the person is not really improved in his character. The fall down, just like you, you know, a child may get put their hand in the fire, they get burned, so they'll be very careful not to get burned again. And the same way people fall down, they have an accidental fall down, they, they should become more cautious and they should become more aware and more careful in their devotional service. So Prabhupada said, if one does not improve in his character, then he's understood, that's understood that he's not a high devotee. So this is the point. Okay, we want to understand carefully. Going ahead, text number 31. Yes, someone can read. Shipram bhavati dharmatma sachvak chanti nigachati kanteya prati janihi name bhakta pranashyati. He quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. O son of Kunti, declare it boldly that my devotee never perishes. Mm. Hare Krishna Mahaprabhu. Thank you Prabhu. Yes. So, Lord Krishna is describing about this, uh, this Suduracha devotee, the one with the abominable habits, but still he's engaged in devotional service. And Lord Krishna describes, yes, he may have terrible habits, but he, he can quickly become righteous and attain lasting peace. And so this is a famous verse, of course, as well, especially the second half of the verse, Kunti Apriti Janihi, 
Nami Bhakta Pranashati. O son of Kunti, declare it boldly, my devotee never perishes. So this is important point also. Lord Krishna asks Arjuna, declare it. You tell everyone, Arjuna. Different reasons are given. Why, why would Krishna tell Arjuna to declare it? Yes, someone can tell me. Why did Krishna ask Arjuna to tell everyone, my devotee never perishes? Dr. Guru. Guru Svarna Mataji, you raised your hand. Hare Krishna. Uh, it's, it's said that um, if his devotee says it, then Krishna will never break the promise. He may break the promise, but his devotee, he will always be, uphold his promise. Oh, Krishna will break his promise? Sometimes he may do so. And it is explained just like in the Mahabharata. Krishna said he will not pick up weapons, but to save his devotee Arjun, he picked up the chariot wheel of uh, Arjun's rat to save Arjun. In the beginning of Mahabharata, Krishna said he will not fight, but he fought for Arjun. Mm -hmm. So therefore it is said that if Krishna says my devotee will say it, then I will never break the promise. Okay. Yes. Any other reason? Maharaj actually, Maharaj actually, earlier they had faced many problems, difficulties. Even there was life was in a position to die, but they anyhow surpassed all the difficulties. So Arjuna was one of them, and he has experienced like he had Duryodhana had given poison to him and fire in that house. All these matters that they are rescued by the Krishna. So he should declare that so he, Krishna gave him chance to declare Arjuna. Okay. Because, because Krishna had saved his devotees from many different dangerous situations. Yes, so, Arjuna, so Arjuna had good experience how Krishna protects his devotees. Okay. Interesting point. Yes. Another reason? Uh, Maharaj, a uh, uh, word of mouth is better than uh, self speech. So, <laughs> the word, word of mouth is better than what? Speaking by the, by himself. Someone else's word is better than Krishna's word. Yeah, means uh, th that is more effective for people who are understanding that uh, okay, uh, Krishna himself is God, so he is telling like that he to prove himself to be God. But if someone else says that uh, he has protected me, then it becomes more uh, effective. <laughs> okay, yes. Well, as Maharaj, I was just thinking even Neha Vikram and Ashoski, so even the little endeavor we do, it's not going to perish. So he will, we will only keep improving. So Krishna will preserve that uh, things. He will make sure that we are improving, we don't deteriorate. Okay. Yes. Any other reason? I I was thinking one reason I heard. One reason is a, is a it's it's a it's a humorous response, because Krishna is from Vrindavan. He's a bridge bassi, and they think the bridge bassis are known to be not truthful. <laughs> and so when. <laughs> When Krishna speaks, you know, Krishna is worried that whatever I say, they, they may not accept because, you know, I'm a bridge bassi and the bridge bassis are not so honest. And so, Arjuna, you're a Kshatriya, you speak, you know, your words will be true. Okay? All right? Some, oh, this is Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur again speaking on this. Can someone read? Abhinash Prabhu? Okay, Ras Bihari Prabhu. Yeah, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur 9.31 commentary. Uh, how can you ac accept the worship of such a simple person? 
how can you eat the food and drink offered by the heart uh, by a heart contaminated with lust and anger very quickly he becomes righteous the present is used and not the future to express the fact that having committed a sin by remembering the lord he becomes repentant and thus he quickly becomes righteous oh how fortunate how unfortunate i am there are there is no one as low as i bringing bad name to the devotees repeatedly shashwat he feels completely ni for nitram disgust shantim for those actions or the use of the present tense can indicate that in the future he will develop righteousness fully but even right now it exists in a subtle form after taking medicine though the destructive effects of fever or poison remains for some time it is not considered seriously thus with the entrance of bhakti in his mind the sinful actions are not taken seriously all right thank you prabhu let's look over this again just now so the devotee is asking that you know this is a sinful person so how could you he, he's saying to lord krishna how could you accept the worship of such a sinful person you know we are so we have high standards about who can offer worship to krishna they should be brahmanas they must be practicing very strictly and so the devotee may question to krishna how could you accept the worship of such a sinful person how could you eat the food and drink given by somebody who is so lusty and angry you going to eat the offerings from him so the, the devotee may uh, uh, appeal to krishna like this you know generally when we take food and water and drink so on we want to take it from the the pure hearted souls otherwise you take their karma so the devotees are, are asking to krishna that how could you accept their offering but lord krishna responds he said no very quickly he becomes righteous and then there's discussion about the use of the the verb and which tense he used so the present tense is used rather rather than the future because the present tense indicates that he committed sin the that the present is used to 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 show us that he's he committed sin but at the same time he remembered the lord and he became repentant and so he felt very guilty he became very sorry that he done such a sinful thing and so very quickly he became righteous and he was thinking the sinful man is thinking how unfortunate i am there is no one as low as i am bringing bad name to the devotees so the devotee feels guilt he feels hate for himself that i'm such a rascal i'm bringing bad name on the devotees and repeatedly he feels complete disgust for those actions for the things he's done he feels so ashamed he feels so bad about it so that's one way of understanding it then we're given another one we see the the use of the present tense can indicate that in the future he will become a devotee he will become good so in the future just now he's not but in the future he will become good and right now it's in a subtle form and then he gives an interesting example he talks about taking medicine and sometimes you have to take some medicine which uh uh 
where you have a, a fever or some, some, maybe some poison is there. If you take some, you have some fever, you take some medicine. So, uh, it's not taken very seriously. The medicine, you take the medicine and quickly you become cured. The fever doesn't remain. In the same way, when there's devotion in his mind, then the sinful action are not taken seriously. The sinful, the sins which he did are not so bad because devotion came into his mind. So just like the medicine comes into the, the body, cures the fever, so the devotion comes into the heart and he corrects the mentality of the sinful devotee. And the devotee feels very repentant, very sorry that he did such bad things. He will never do it again. So this is the idea here. Some more commentaries here from Vishwana Chakravarti Prabhupada in relation to the same point, continuing. And the traces of sin, such as lust and anger, should be considered insignificant, like the biting of a toothless snake. Right? If you get this, sometimes they bring the snake, they have a big poison snake, but they cut out the fangs. So the, the snake has no teeth. So the snake cannot cause you any harm because he has no no poison, no, there's no venom coming out from him. They've already cut out the, pang, the fangs from the snake. So toothless snake. So that's compared to the, the, the devotee, this person who is, has traces of sin. The traces of sin which are there in the devotee, the lust, the anger, they, they shouldn't be considered very important because the person is a devotee. So thus he attains complete cessation of lust and anger permanently. In Nigajati, Ni stands for Nitaram, completely. This means that even during the stage of having tendency to commit sin, he has a pure heart. If he eventually becomes righteous, there would be no argument. However, if a devotee is sinful right up to his death, what is his position? So this is the question asked. If he eventually becomes righteous, all right, there's no argument if he becomes righteous. However, what if a devotee is sinful right up to his death? What is his position? So the reply is given, the Lord, affectionate to his devotee, then speaks loudly with a little anger, O son of Kunti, my devotee is not destroyed. At the time of death, he does not fall. So like this, this is the initial response. What happens to this person at the time of death? My devotee is not destroyed destroyed. At the time of death, he does not fall, but somebody, but arguers with harsh tongues will not accept this. So this is the response. You say he doesn't fall, but we may say, well, uh, people with harsh, harsh tongues will not respect this. They're not going to like this. So Krishna then encourages the worried, lamenting Arjuna, O Kuntiya, give up this squabbling assembly. Giving up, oh, oh, going, going to the squabbling, O Kuntiya, going to the squabbling assembly 
with a tumultuous sound of drums, throwing your hands in the air, you should fearlessly declare this. All right? What should they declare? What does does what Krishna want Arjuna to declare? That's why he would give it to the I do it in our places. Right. Name Bhakta Pranashyati. So Krishna encourages Arjuna like this. Go to that assembly where people are saying well, they don't respect and tell them what I say, that my devotee never perishes. Declare what? Arjuna asks, declare what? Krishna said, declare that my devotee the devotee of the Supreme Lord, though committing sin, does not perish, but rather reaches success. Arguments defeated, pride deflated, they should undoubtedly respect you as a guru. This is Sridhar Swami's explanation. But why does the Lord order Arjuna to declare this when he could do it himself? As he will say later, Mami Vaishyasi Satyam Te Pratijani Priyosti Me. I declare to you that you are truly come to me. You are very dear to me. In the same way, why does he not? See, why does he not now say, I declare Kuntia that my devotee does not perish. So why does Krishna not say? So this is responding. Uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains. The reason is explained here. The Lord considered as follows. Being affectionate to my devotee, and not tolerating even a slight degradation of my devotee. I will, under all circumstances, uphold the declaration made by my devotee, whereas I can break my own promise and accept criticism of myself. Just as in breaking my own promise in fighting with Bhishma, I fulfilled Bhishma's promise. Thus, Hearing a declaration from my mouth, the materialistic disputers will laugh and they will accept Arjuna's declaration as if written on stone. Therefore, I have Arjuna make the declaration. And thus one should not accept the statements of the falsely intelligent persons who, after hearing about Ananya Bhakti, even of the greatest sinner, think that this declaration made by the pure devotee cannot apply in cases where attachment to wife and children, sinful acts, lamentation, illusion, lust, anger, and other despicable qualities manifest. Uh, so this way, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is presenting to us an allegorical conversation here between Lord Krishna and Arjuna. Mm, Arjuna was arguing, the sinner is really your devotee? And Krishna is saying, undoubtedly he is my devotee. Mm, he, he is my devotee. You, we have to understand this. That Krishna is arguing to defend his devotee. But what kind of person? The greatest sinner, and Krishna wants him to be a devotee? This declaration made by the pure devotee cannot apply? Well, Krishna also explained up here that, well, I, I broke my promise by fighting, but I allowed Bhishma to keep his promise. So when Krishna broke his promise, it was to allow Bhishma to keep his promise. Because Bhishma had promised that tomorrow I will either kill Krishna or Arjuna, or Krishna will break his promise. Either I will kill Arjuna or Krishna will break his promise and fight. And so it happened 
that Krishna fought. Krishna broke his promise. And in this way Krishna protected Arjuna and he protected also Bhishma's promise because Bhishma had promised either I will kill Arjuna or Krishna will break his promise. So Krishna thought, all right, I will break my promise. So that's the argument there. Okay, so here's a little exercise you could think about. How could the message of statement of Lord Krishna in chapter 9, verse 31, that his devotee will never perish, be misunderstood? And what is the actual meaning here? I have one doubt perhaps. Okay, you have a doubt? Actually, during the declaration of Arjuna, at that time Krishna had not broken the promise of uh, that he will not make war against the Vishwanath. So, how he is telling that no, Vishwanath Thakur is telling that uh, he will uh, broke his promise? Vishwanath. At that time, war had not been uh, started. Just beginning of the war, he is declaring, Krishna is declaring. So, whether he had told the future things to the Arjuna? Well, yeah, yeah, of course, he knows the future. Krishna knows the future. Krishna knew he's going to break his promise. Krishna's, means, Krishna's that on. Means, huh? That means uh, Arjuna known that uh, some, this type of thing will happen in future. Krishna knew, Krishna knew it's going to happen in the future. It's Krishna speaking. That's why Krishna tells Arjuna, Krishna knows I'm going to break my promise. So let Arjuna announce. Yeah, Krishna knew. Krishna knows the future, he knows everything. Yeah, he knows, but uh, Arjuna could know from listening from uh, Krishna. Well, so, well, Krishna is telling Arjuna, you do it, just just do it. Of course, Arjuna didn't know, but Krishna told him, you do it, I want you to do this, you declare it. And so Krishna is oh. telling Arjuna to do it. So Arjuna is the devotee of Krishna, so he does what Krishna tells him. Okay, Maharaj, thank you. All right? So we'll give you a few, some five, t ten minutes, you can think about this. Chapter 9, verse 31. How can it be misunderstood and what is the actual meaning here? Guru Maharaj, would you like breakout rooms or yes. just leave? Yes, how will we do it? How many people do we have? Yeah, 18 of us. 18, all right. Yeah. So uh, how many we'll have? Uh, 666. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, 666, okay. Prabhu, it's only 16 uh, participants is shown here. No, 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 you must add three others, you know, they are double doubles. Okay. Um, okay, the room is going to be open, so we will finish exactly in four minutes and then one extra minute for us to come back. Yes, if you...
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. They are all coming back. Okay. We are all back. All right. All right. So then we, we could have a volunteer from one of the groups to tell us what, first of all, in which way in this verse may be misunderstood. Uh, group, one. Uh, group one. Group one, group two, like that? Yes. I'm in group one. Okay. Guru Hare Krishna. The misunderstanding here is in, in the purport of Srila Prabhupada's in this text 31 is that we have learned in chapter 7 that sinful person they do not surrender unto Krishna. But again here it said that if if this sinful person do surrender, then they can become pure devotees. So we can see that actually Krishna is showing uh, with this verse uh, that um, anyone can uh, anyone can become purified and by surrendering unto Krishna, they will get Krishna's protection. So hereby we are seeing that how Krishna is showing favoritism to his devotees. Um, he considers uh, devotees saintly, even if he commits a horrible act and he quickly purifies the devotee. So no, I, just, we are uh, talking uh, about how... I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a little worried, a, a little worried here, you know, that you, you, you began a little bit off track, I think. You know, first of all, you, you, we were to look at the statement of Lord Krishna. It wasn't the purport where there's any misunderstanding, but rather okay. it's the statement of Lord Krishna which may be misunderstood. Right? The statement of Lord Krishna may be misunderstood. So, in, in which way could this st this statement of Lord Krishna be misunderstood? Maybe uh, a devotee will not perish because he has done some loving devotional service. So, Krishna remains grateful to the devotees for his, their uh, devotional lives. So, uh, they but, will not uh, which, gr which group are you, Prabhu? Maharaj, uh, same group. Same as uh -huh. Okay. So, so, so for the little devotional service, Krishna remains grateful to them and uh, his uh, devotees never, principal uh, means they will never fall. They will be taken into the Krishna Loka or Gola uh, They are in the service even after doing the, some abhinavinal work. And uh, examples of Jagai Madhai, Mahaprabhu delivered them. And uh, uh, also another example in Raman and Balmik, and that he could not able to chant Ram. By chanting Mara Mara, he could able to uh, get the Supreme Thought. That is our... Uh, uh, okay. Now, I, I don't know if you've quite got the point here. I, I don't know. Let me, let me hear the other groups. Let me hear what we got from group number two. Pregis Maharaj. Uh, but the basic point what uh, could be misunderstood is that uh, uh, people can take this as a license to make mistakes. So, yeah. commit mistakes. They're committing uh, mistakes on the strength of the Lord is saying you can, uh, he's saying that, uh, you know, I yeah. will protect you, uh, you will never perish. So, immediately people start doing offenses, thinking that somehow the Lord will definitely protect us. That kind of misunderstanding, as well as Sakhi Rangadevi Mataji and Sudevi Mataji were saying that devotees think that, you know, you're a devotee, you should not die. Means the Lord will protect you. There are people who think like that also. Yes. As well as, uh, um, um, uh, means uh, Amar Nimai Prabhu and I had a point about... Uh, they do not undergo difficulties. Devotees means they should not undergo difficulties. So uh, when my mother um, underwent an operation, uh, so 99% they said it will be cancer. 
So when she underwent the whole operation, all the relatives came and said that, you know, you're a devotee. How come such a thing happened to you? Then nobody understood or realized in one person it came out that it is not cancer. So we never know how Krishna shows his mercy or you know, everyone undergoes difficulties because we are in this material world. So it's not that devotees means they will not... Uh, of course, Krishna protects us and preserves us. Like that, Amar Nimai Prabhu was saying that his father was a doctor and how come a doctor undergoes difficulties? Everyone is ultimately people, I mean, in this material world. So we undergo difficulties and suffering. But definitely Krishna will protect us in the sense that he will protect our soul, Neha Vikram and Ashosti, and we will not deteriorate from wherever we are. Okay. Yes, I think this this is pretty... Too much to the point. Yes, people thinking we won't perish. There's so many ways in which they think Krishna should be protecting us. And we want to take service from Krishna. Yet group number three? What about group number three? Who is the spokesman there? No, I remember who is in group number three, uh, Guru Maharaj. Anyone who was in group number three, can you all please? But, but it's, it is a Panmulachan Prabhu, Satish Prabhu, Silavati Madaji, Subhadra Oh, Madhaji. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so we were only three groups. I was still thinking we are five groups. Uh, sorry, sorry, Guru Maharaj. Sorry, I'm already my Prabhu. Uh, essentially, um, Subhadra Madaji brought up a very important point. It's important for us to remember that there are different gradations of devotee and this could be you know something which is more for the pure devotees just like you know Guru Maharaj you emphasized the point on uh, that verse uh, Ananya Chinta Yunto Mam Ye Jana Prayopasati that the Lord will you know the best insurance policy is yes but you must be pure on your side of the equation you must be as pure as you can another very important point which you know we were discussing connecting it back to the earlier verse is that Many a times when something happens uh, or, or when there's a perceived, you know, perceived downfall or, or of, of a devotee, we become judgmental. But 30 and 31 keeps on emphasizing to us, especially Vishwana Chakravati Thakur's purport, that whatever is happening to a devotee is between the Lord and the devotee. We cannot be judgmental. You know, there's no space for us to be judgmental. That's between the Lord and the devotee. We do not know what is the background, the context, etc. Um, you know, and I was just reminded of a wonderful poem which Mahatma Das had written, where he says that, you know, I, 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 I've left the body and I went to the spiritual world. And there I'm actually seeing that, you know, that the... The temple commander who stole the temple money, he is also there in Goloka Vrindavan. <laughs> Those people who have done so much of sins, in my opinion, they are also there in Goloka Vrindavan. They are doing so much more service than what I am allowed to do. Therefore, the lesson I can learn is that I cannot be judgmental. It is between the Lord and the devotee. Hare Krishna. <laughs> 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 okay, a lot of sound effects here. Yes, thank you very much, Padmalochan. It was very nice. Uh, yes, we shouldn't be judgmental. It's between the devotee and Krishna. So some people think we, we should never perish because we're devotees, you know. How is it we get cancer? How is it we get sick? How is it we die? You know, we're devotees, <laughs> of course. We're still subject to the limitations of the material body that's going to be there. Sometimes people forget that the body's material. We had a case in China one time, there was one man, he got initiation and a few months later he was diagnosed with cancer. And so he was lamenting himself. He thought, how is it I got cancer? I just got initiation. He said, oh, my friends, they're telling me, what's the good of your practice? It didn't protect you. <laughs> hmm. 
So I had to talk to him and tell him that, you know, this is the time for you to actually begin preaching now. That Krishna is giving you warning, the nature of the material body. The body is temporary. The body will perish sooner or later. And so we have, to, we have to accept that. But we have to prepare for that by taking shelter of Krishna. And if we take shelter of Krishna, then we'll, our position will be secure. In other words, the next life we'll be able to go on to be with Krishna and to be closer to Krishna and to have a better uh, situation to improve our spiritual life. And so it's certainly often people misunderstand that. They think that taking up devotional service means they think no more misery. No, there will be misery, there will be problems. But the difficulties is that the devotee can tolerate them, the devotee can deal with them, he can accept the difficulties when they come. And he can go on with his devotional service. So that's the main point. The actual meaning here, that the devotee's Krishna consciousness will maintain. Right? Whatever service we do, we never lose. It goes in our spiritual bank account. And the spiritual bank account, it never exhausts. It, we, we never, it never diminishes. It's always there. Not like our material bank account. Everything is, you know, we're running out of money all the time. But spiritual bank account, eternal benefit. Okay, so here's... Uh, some notes on it. This is, oh, where did, I don't know where we got this from now. So here Krishna says, Kunti Apriti Jani He, you promised, so I shall protect your promise. Nami Bhakta Pranashyati, anyone who is taken to Krishna consciousness will be never destroyed. Nami Bhakta Pranashyati, of course, a living entity is never destroyed, so far as his constitution is concerned. Nahanyate hanyamani. The destruction of this body is not destruction. The real destruction is that if we lose our spiritual consciousness, we can also lose our identity. In our material conception of life, we are practically destroyed because as spiritual beings, we have a blissful, eternal life. We have full knowledge, but here we live in wretched conditions, feeling that life is not eternal, not blissful, and not in full knowledge. So, we are already destroyed. So are we already destroyed? Yes, we are already destroyed. <laughs> and some more. We are thinking we are advancing on civilization, but unless we revise, unless we revive our original life of eternity, full knowledge and bliss, we should know that we are not advancing. We are being defeated by the illusory energy. This is destruction. Destruction of real life is materialism. So here Krishna says, Kunti Apriti Janihi, please declare in the world that anyone who is taken to this Krishna consciousness will never be destroyed. He will never go back again to that material life of sense gratification and to this material existence full of misery. From Prabhupada's lecture on the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verses 27 to 32, in New York, 1966. All right. And text 32, 
Mamhi Partavaya Pashritya, Yepi Shu Papa Yonaya, Striya Vaishas Tata Sudras, Tepi Anti Parangati, Mosana Prita, those who take shelter in me, though they be of lower birth, women, Vaishas, Sudras, can attain the supreme destination. So, Lord Krishna is describing everyone can attain the supreme destination. And he, he, some people may not like this, that we're classified as lower birth, but everyone's lower birth in Kali Yuga. Kalo Sudra Sambhava. Kali Yuga, we're all Sudras and lower. And so everyone, not just women, not just the Vaishyas, everyone, we're all low birth. But we can all attain the supreme destination if we take shelter of Krishna. Prabhupada's, this is Prabhupada's lecture on the topic. In India, according to the caste system or Varnashram Dharma, the Brahman and Kshatriya are considered to be the highest in the society. The Vaishya is a little less than them and the Sudras are not taken into account. Similarly, women are classified as, su as sudra. The thread ceremony is given to the brahmana, kshatri and vaishya, but there is no thread ceremony a woman can be born into a brahmana family. She does not have that benefit because striya, women are seen as less intelligent. They should be given protection, but they cannot be elevated. But here in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna surpasses all these formalities. He is giving opportunities to everyone, regardless of birth. In the social structure, you may consider that a woman is less intelligent or a sudra is less purified, but in spiritual consciousness, there is no such bar. Krishna accepts everyone. It doesn't matter whether you are a woman, a sudra or a vaishya. If you simply take to Krishna consciousness, the Lord is there. He will give you all protection and gradually he will help you. One who is in Krishna consciousness is already in the liberated platform. Simply ship from it will take some time, Shipram, but very soon he will be all right. So this is the purport of Lord Krishna and this is the facility of Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada elaborating there on the purport of that verse. Shipram bhavati bar dharmatma shasvaj chantim nigachati Kuntiya priti janihi nami bhakta pranashati. Right? Even though we be of lower birth, we quickly become righteous. Shipram just takes a little time and they will attain lasting peace. And then? Yes? Someone else can read this one? Hare Krishna. Even one born into a low grade family can be elevated without exception. That is Sastra. But there are rascals who do not allow this. They have their own ideas. Krishna never said that only the Brahmanas or Indians or Hindus can take shelter of me. Mam hi prata vya prashitya. Ye pi shu. Whatever he may be, there is no restriction. Just like anyone can take a bath in the Ganges, it is not that only a particular person or particular community can take a bath. Anyone can, and he becomes purified. There is an example. Na hi hirate. Jyotsya Chandras Chandala Vesh Mani. When there is moonlight, there is no discrimination that 
a Bangi's house should receive the moonshine, while at a Chandala's house there should be none. The moon shine upon the palace of the king or on the house of a Chandala. Na hi hirte jutsna chanda chandala vishmami. Krishna's mercy is for everyone and it is not restricted to a certain community or class of people. Anyone can take advantage of Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Madhiji. Thank you. So Prabhupada is using this to support Lord Krishna's teaching that everyone can become Krishna conscious. Oh, uh, here we have a little case study. We don't have a lot of time left, but we can look through it quickly. Case number one. One famous Indian leader named all those who were born in lower class families as Harijans, people of God. Evaluate his attempt. What is consistent with Srila Prabhupada's teaching and what is inconsistent? Ask the question, if everyone is equal in the eyes of God, why is there a division of society into four varnas? Okay. Everyone understand this question? The Harijans, the lower class people, they're considered people of God. So, he tried to, of course this is Mahatma Gandhi, uh, he tried to rubber stamp the lower class families and he tried to make them into people of God just by giving the name Harijans. So what's the problem? The problem was he didn't, he didn't change the qualities, he didn't teach them, he didn't show them how to actually improve their life, to actually become people of God. You don't make people of God godly just by giving them the name Harijan. So that's the problem with that move. So if everyone is equal in the eyes of God, why is there a division of society into four varnas? Yeah, everyone, you, every, yes. okay, Prabhu, go ahead. You want to answer the question? Everyone is equal in the eyes of God spiritually. Everyone's a spirit soul. Why is there a division of society into four varnas? Because our bodies are different. Psychophysical natures are different. Spiritually, we're equal. Is from Maharaj, actually the four Navarnas or the divisions are made according to the nature of a person. So we are all having a nature within us. So uh, according to the nature, the divisions are made for us to... Well, I just uh, said that. I just said that. I spoke about the psychophysical nature. Actually, to elevate them into higher conscious, the Varnasam system has been uh, there. Okay, we'll go ahead. Yes, Case number two. One devotee recently gave the Sunday class lecture before a, clou a crowd of 500 people, mainly from the ethnic Hindu community. In so doing, he called the leader mentioned above, in other words, Mahatma Gandhi, he called him a foolish politician. Many listeners became upset and over a hundred walked out before the class had finished. Evaluate. Evaluate. Well, certainly he made a mistake to criticize someone. Prabhupada would never criticize people by name. Prabhupada would simply ask, what is their philosophy? And then he would explain the defects in the person's philosophy or the defects in the person's uh, teachings, what was wrong with it. But Prabhupada would never criticize the person. So this the devotee, if somebody was giving a class like this, he made a big mistake to criticize someone publicly, particularly someone who has respected all over India and who has, uh, who has uh, recognized as a great social worker. And so it's certainly a very big mistake to criticize people, someone who has the support of the, the, 
the people. We, sh we may criticize their philosophy, but don't criticize the person. Now answer the question, if we were asked before a crowd of people, what do you think of Gandhi's attempts to help the untouchables? What would you reply? Students might do well to consider how Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nichananda exemplified the first sentence of the purport to verse 32. The first sentence of the purport to verse 32 is So the first sentence of verse purport to verse 32 this should not be misunderstood in the seventh chapter the Lord says that one who is engaged in the devotional activities cannot become a one who is engaged in one who is engaged in mischievous activities cannot become a devotee of the Lord. Maharaj, that's 31. This is 32. Oh, oh it's 32. Thank you, Manaji. It is clearly declared here by the Supreme Lord that in devotional service there is no distinction between lower and higher classes of people. There's no distinction. Spiritually, they're equal. One life somebody may be high class, next life they may be low class. It's very temporary, the body. All right, so these are different questions which sometimes come up. We have to deal with them. We have to answer them. All right. We'll go ahead. Here's uh, the final verse of the chapter. And this is considered the most confidential knowledge. This is the conclusion of Krishna's teaching and dealing with his devotees. Manmana bhava mad bhakto mad yaji mam namaskuru mam ivaishyasi yupvaivam atmanam mat parayanaha. Engage your mind always in thinking of me. Become my devotee, offer obeisances to me, worship me, being completely absorbed in me. Surely you will come to me. So four activities are recommended from Prabhupada's lecture. This confidential service, preaching of Bhagavad Gita, is essential. Sarva dharmam parigyajnam mami kam sharanam braja. Simply go and preach. Krishna says, Manmana bhava mad bhakto madhyaji mam namaskuru. It is Krishna's desire that we preach to the world. Just be Krishna conscious. Manmana, just become Krishna's devotees. Manmana bhava mad bhakto madhyaji. Just worship Krishna madhyaji mam. Just offer your obeisances to Krishna. Four words, then you become a preacher. It is not very difficult to become a preacher and to become a spiritual master. How? It's simple. Go and teach what Krishna says. That's all. You have nothing to make up. So, so final exercise. Study verses 30, 32, 34, identify what is the mood of Srila Prabhupada describe, what is the mood Srila Prabhupada describing here? How did Prabhupada exemplify this mood through practical activities? What do we learn about pushing forward Srila Prabhupada's mission? All right. This is a, an interesting exercise on mood and mission. You just have five minutes. <laughs> you could take a verse, we had, right, make three groups, and one group, each group will take one verse. Group one will take group, verse number 30, group two, verse 32, and group three, verse 34. Right? Okay, Guru Maharaj. And we want to know what is Prabhupada's mood here. 
What is the mood of Srila Prabhupada in that verse? And how did Prabhupada exemplify this mood? How did he show it? By his practical activities. And what do we learn for pushing Prabhupada's mission? Just try it. Okay, okay Guru Maharaj. So group one will do number 30, group two, 32, and group three will do 34, the same groups as earlier on. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I think Padmulas Prabhu is creating the regrouping the Zoom. Sorry, regrouping the group. So Sakhi Mataji, you need to accept when we assign you. I think initially you did not accept probably, but it's okay. It's... So Guru Maharaj, we are all trickling back. Okay.
Okay, Pranesh, we are all back. Marina, were you able to... I don't know if you had enough time to do this exercise. It actually, it's quite... It requires quite a bit of thought here. Nah. Did any? Does anybody? Did you come to any conclusions about this, Prabhupada's mood? Uh, group one, would, would you like to speak on verse number thirty, please? Guru Smarana Mataji, you can, because we discussed Mataji, but a very, very on a basic level, not very deep. Yes. Uh, yeah, I could understand. We just, Hare Krishna. We we land in this verse of um, thirty that um, Shri Prabhupada practically um, had this mood that he accepted everyone, um, even they they had done so much uh, sinful. He engaged everyone in uh, devotional service. He said um, and made everyone sadhu. So. Um, People were questioning that, uh, what magic did you do? And Shri Prabhupada said, I didn't do any magic. I just told them who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Krishna is for everyone. So in this way, um, we can see Shri Prabhupada's mood that he was um, um, engaging everyone, making everyone devotees. And we also have this example of how devotees... Um, um, even if after becoming, uh, taking shelter of Shri Prabhupada, um, we had in our class that how Sham Sundar Prabhu was to go to jail. And um, when he went to uh, Shri Prabhupada and told him that um, I have to go to jail and Shri Prabhupada said, what happened? And he said, I've been uh, guilty of doing drug dealing. And Shri Prabhupada said, okay, I was also a drug dealer. I was also handling drugs. He meant, he, and we can see how Shubhapad was so encouraging. He said, yes, go and um, um, go to, your, just keep chanting. So uh, in this way, he, when he finished his jail sentence, he came back and Shubhapad was so welcoming. So we can learn that Shubhapad was always very forgiving. He was uh, a very, um, he never uh, judge, uh, he was not judgmental and he was always um, accepting and, and provided we were sincere and adhering to his uh, uh, instruction of uh, engaging ourselves in devotional sex. Okay, thank you, Madhiji. Thank you very much. Very nice. Nice. Nice to hear these examples. Yes. What about group number two? Did you get in? Are you able to comment a little? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, the devotion, uh, actually it's written in the purport that the devotional service and the guidance of a pure devotees are so strong that there is no discrimination between a lower and a higher class of men. Anyone can take it. So we are all ultimately uh, individual souls and Prabhupada knew it very well. So that's why he never discriminated. Even though in India there were so many caste systems going on, Prabhupada went out of the world, means out of the way to go and preach the West, and uh, he never discriminated, especially women, Vaishyas and Shudras, uh, because everyone is, as you said, everyone is lower born in Kali Yuga. So Prabhupada never uh, dis, uh, means gave everyone a chance to do whatever best they can do according to their uh, nature and their services. Uh, he gave especially women. Yes, very good. Thank you very much. Very nice. And uh, he would add something. Uh, especially uh, for, for the woman, uh, he, uh, he gave a chance for uh, Yamuna Mataji's uh, Govinda Madhi Purusham to be sung in all the temples. That is one of the biggest things that uh, was not uh, possible for a woman to do. And yes. He wanted uh, everyone to become jnanis and yogis. That was his uh, the last line of this purport says, Prabhupada wanted everyone how to become there. That, this is a sign that he is giving us for uh, making us jnanis and yogis. Greater than granny jnanis and yogis, sorry. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to add some points. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Krishna Consciousness, Srila Prabhupada had, uh, uh, through his example, shown, demonstrated that Krishna Consciousness is for everyone and it can raise any person, no matter how fallen one may be to the platform of being a devotee of the Supreme Lord or coming onto the transcendental platform. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah. Uh, it, it's for Dira Adira both, yeah, all classes of Dira Adira consciousness is for everyone. And uh, I, there was one incident, Maharaj, uh, maybe you probably know better, but I, I, I somewhat read this, that Yamuna Mataji once went to Srila Prabhupada and said that women are considered less intelligent and uh, of lower birth. And Srila Prabhupada said that if you consider it that way, <laughs> so if you consider yourself, if one becomes a devotee, then these designations do not matter. One becomes on a transcendental platform. All right. Yes, good. Yeah, if, we think you're, if you think you're a woman, <laughs> we should think of ourselves as spirit souls, not the body. Right. Very good. Thank you very much. And we'll just hear from group number Thank three. You, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. So, um, for verse number three, it was it was fairly straightforward because you know Shri Prabhupada, as our founder Acharya, as the Acharya, he was always living this this verse, which is engaging his mind always in thinking of the Lord, you know, becoming the Lord's devotees, offering obeisances, worshiping the Lord, totally absorbed in the Lord, and therefore he was teaching everyone how to do it. Right? So he was really exemplifying this mode through the entire activities of ISKCON. And um, something which was really important in the purport was that Sri Prabhupada mentioned when you are fully absorbed, you will not be deviated. And so, and it's the entire mercy of Sri Prabhupada where he, he kept on emphasizing on this verse because it's telling us, and he was emphasizing that in Krishna consciousness, there's no discrimination. If there's no barrier, it is open to all. Yeah, so that's what our group um, oh, wonderful. Okay, very good. And we see that the common um, points coming out from each of the groups. You all recognize that Krishna consciousness is for everyone. And Prabhupada certainly made the Krishna consciousness movement available for everyone. And there is no question of discrimination anywhere. So very good, very nice. Just a conclusion here. The Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Vedic literature. The middle six chapters are the essence of the Gita. And the ninth and tenth chapter are the essence of the middle six chapters. Finally, the last verse of this chapter which is exactly in the middle of the Gita and which will be repeated practically verbatim at the end of the Gita is the most confidential and essential sloka. It is the essence of the essence of the essence and the most confidential of all knowledge. Become a pure devotee of Lord Krishna from surrender unto me. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions? Any comment, buddy? Maharaj, uh, the other day, yesterday you were talking about the impersonalist. There are two kinds of impersonalists. Uh, so I just wanted to understand more about this Brahma Gyanis and the other impersonalists. Generally, impersonalist means they don't accept the personal feature of the Lord. So what is exactly the Brahma Gyanis accepting then? Well, the Brahma Gyanis, they're accepting the Brahman. They just, they just don't know anything. They don't deny the form of the Lord. They just didn't know anything. They were just, they're, they're just contemplating the Brahman. Like the four Kumars. The four Kumars come to the spiritual world. They're Brahma Gyanis. And they don't know. But when they see the Lord, they immediately become attracted. But initially, they're Brahmaganis. They were fixed on the Brahman. They, they'd ha they, want, they were attracted to the Brahman and to that oneness. But they, were, they, never, they never thought of the Lord as being an ordinary person or being material. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Why one question? Yes. Uh, in text 9.14, it is written as divine nature. Divine nature represents, represents, represents the Lord Krishna. I'm sorry. Krishna, yes. What's... In, text, in text 14, it is written as divine nature. This represents as this represents of Lord Krishna, divine nature. 
text 14, that, that's what, what my object, Shina, is it? Text 14. Man, 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 Yes, yes. Manmanas to Manpata. Mahatmanas to Manpata. Yes, I, yes. It's written as divine nature. Yes, the under nature. the protection of the divine nature. Yes. Right? If, if that is uh, applicable to Krishna, this word, this line, divine nature. Yes, Krishna, they're under the protection of Krishna, Krishna's nature. Yes, because they're fully engaged in devotional service. So they're under the protection of the divine nature. Even nature, even nature is Krishna. Is it right, Maharaj? The nature is it's Krishna's nature. Yes, it's Krishna's spiritual energy. Thank you very much, Maharaj. There are no other questions. His Holiness Bhakti Vikna Vinash Narasimha Maharaj Ki. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah. Yeah.